So uh, uh, I'm going to talk about actually some of the work that we've done together. And uh, now this is a little loud, right? OK. <laughs> if they can turn it down a little bit, that's, is that better? OK, great. All right, great. And uh, some of the work we did together uh, and how that fits in with the bigger picture of the things that we're doing in my lab and, and the uh, collaborations that I'm working with. Uh, <clears throat> so I have my presentation broken down into uh, four parts here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the behavior. Uh, some of the neuroanatomy that goes into uh, what we call spoken language and vocal learning. Uh, uh, yes, the convergent genetics behind that and what's also specialized for specific species. And then a hypothesis coming out of this work that we're trying now to test in mice. Uh, so starting out with the behavior. Many of us don't realize that uh, the trait that I'm doing now and that you're listening to uh, is actually consists of multiple components. And here I uh, have uh, re and reviewed recently in an uh, article in Science uh, where um, we talk about um, these multiple components that go into uh, what we're doing now for spoken language as some people c have considered them all as unique to humans, or, but it's not really the case. Some components are more uh, ubiquitous among species like auditory learning and other components are highly specialized, only found in humans and a few other rare species like vocal production learning or even speech production. Uh, and uh, given this, uh, this view of, of a spoken language, at least from a behavioral perspective with the associate neuroanatomy, uh, I'm going to talk really about what we think of spoken language as a specialized form of learned vocal communication with some components found in most vertebrates and a highly specialized vocal learning component found in only a few species. And when I say spoken language, I mean speech in this case. And so uh, the vocal production learners. Uh, there are only five groups of mammals that have been found to have this trait, like Jennifer Lopez, us humans, or dolphins and uh, whales, cetaceans, bats, elephants, and seals, like these are the pinnipeds, the sea lions. Uh, and there are three groups of birds, parrots, songbirds, and hummingbirds. And many people are already aware of that parrots can produce imitated sounds, even our, of our own speech. Uh, <clears throat> and all of these species have close relatives, like chimpanzees to us, or falcons to parrots, that don't learn how to imitate sounds. They can learn other things, but not imitated sounds. And so it's thought that all five of these mammal groups and three bird groups evolved their trait independently of a common ancestor, convergence. Uh, what about another trait that uh, we need for uh, language? Auditory learning, or what we call comprehension learning. Well, this is much more ubiquitous throughout the animal kingdom. And a, a favorite example of mine is your pet animals, dogs. You can teach them to learn how to understand the word sit, respond to that, or siente say in Spanish. Osuari, does anybody know what language that is? No, we don't have any Japanese people here. It's uh, Japanese, all right? <clears throat> Arigato gozaimasta, you know what that is. A dog can understand that in different languages, right? And so, uh, we'll roll over, get the ball, and so forth. But a dog can't say, okay, you got it, I will sit, all right? Instead, a dog goes woof, all right? <clears throat> And it can learn how to produce different, uh, I mean, it can learn how to woof for different uh, requests, like for food, uh, for going outside, and so forth. And we call this vocal usage learning to attach meaning to innate sounds, but it can't actually imitate the acoustic structure and the syntax and sequences of sounds that you hear. Now, <clears throat> not all vocal learners are equal. Uh, humans are the most advanced vocal learners, but there's some that are quite advanced that uh, qu can do quite remarkable things, and one of them is the parrots. In this case, a budgiger, which is a small parakeet. Parakeet means small parrot. And this is an animal named Disco that was raised with humans for four years, learned up to 400 words in that time, uh, and can recombine them into new uh, sentences and so forth. Here, here's an example. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. Are you not a crook? My name is Tesco. Yeah, there goes the dog's woof, right? <laughs> and so, so, yes, that's quite remarkable. And, uh, you know, people ask, well, does Disco know what he's talking about, right? Uh, and even if he didn't, that's still quite remarkable. 
uh, compared to uh, other animals that don't have vocal learning abilities. And so, uh, but you can see when the dog appears, Disco kind of gets the category correct, like says meow, as opposed to woof, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, his owner has basically said Disco and other parrots like this, uh, about 75% of the time seems to be producing words in a random order. Uh, but about 30% of the time producing words in meaningful context. And you can train parents, parrots that actually is to produce words with a meaningful context. Uh, now, compared to uh, Disco, here is one of our closest relatives, uh, great ape, Coco, uh, gorilla, raised with humans for 39 years. And uh, there was a publication back in 2015 where everybody got excited that Coco was learning how to get close to speech. And here is what uh, an example of that's like. How about when you're um, coughing? That was good. You did a sneeze and then a cough. Excellent. Yes, it is excellent, but it's not what Disco does. All right. Uh, here, what's happening is that uh, Coco has very good auditory learning. Uh, Coco understood this, this person asking uh, uh, her to uh, cough, to do other things. You can ask Coco to play a flute, pick up a flute, and blow it, and so forth. So Coco, like many other vertebrates, has good auditory learning, even of human speech in this case. Uh, but Coco doesn't have a, a good ability to modify the sounds that go through the larynx. Coco can voluntarily blow air through the larynx and do certain things with that air, but not modulate it to produce imitated sounds. So the, it's limited uh, in the vocal production learning ability. And so uh, <clears throat> that has prompted this difference. Uh, scientists like myself and others uh, to wonder why can't we teach our closest relatives to do something as simple as say apple in this example when our uh, relatives 300 million years removed from a common ancestor with us goes one uh, further and says golden delicious dummy right and so what's going on here is it in the brain is it the peripheral organs or a combination of both or something like that and so for the uh, second part of my talk I'm going to say it's mostly actually it's all in the brain all right, and, um, and uh, uh, it's really the presence or absence of a t type of neural network, which I think has evolved from an ancient motor learning pathway. And here's some of the evidence for that. So uh, well, actually, when I first got into this field, we found that when songbirds sing, in this case it's a canary, producing learned canary song as opposed to learned speech, uh, in this case, uh, here's an example. <laughs> didn't quite echo like that when the recording, but that you, you, people have heard a canary song before, I'm sure. Uh, that singing activity is associated with a robust induction of the mRNA product of immediate early genes in the brain regions that control the behavior. And it's shown for uh, the uh, EGR1 gene, or CFOS gene as well, at least in, here in HVC song nucleus area, X song nucleus, this is an in situ hybridization. The white signal is the mRNA product. The red is crestovilet staining of the brain. Here, this is the front of the brain and the back in the cerebellum here. And we see for every song bout the bird sings within a half hour period, we get a one fold increase per, per sing, song bout. It's a very robust energetic response in the brain. Uh, and we found that this uh, singing driven gene expression occurs independent of auditory feedback independent of seeing another bird, independent of somatosensory feedback, because we can even cut the muscles that go to the larynx and the bird tries to sing, but it's mute. And even when it attempts to sing and doesn't get any sound out, you see this gene activation in the brain. And so we call this motor-driven gene expression. And we did the same kinds of experiments across multiple bird species, vocal learners and non-learners, and found that in all of them, in blue, here we can find uh, regions of the forebrain that are part of the auditory pathway that show gene activation, immediate early gene activation, when they're hearing sounds, particularly species-specific sounds, in vocal learners and non-learners, like chickens or quails. But only in the vocal learning species, the parrots, hummingbirds, and songbirds, did we see regions in red and yellow here that become active when they're producing vocalizations, whereas the non-learners only show brainstem regions that were active during production of innate sounds in uh, gray here. So what's remarkable about this, if you look at this phylogenetic tree that I had been using for many years, uh, <clears throat> what you would have to argue is that all the vocal learners in the last 65 million years or so independently evolved a similar brain circuit consisting exactly of seven brain regions of, in red necessary for imitating sounds, in blue projecting down to the brainstem motor neurons that produce the actual sounds. And so that's quite remarkable. So three independent gains, 
or maybe they're so similar, one would argue a common origin back here somewhere, and then swifts, owls, and so forth, and cranes all lost the trait uh, while these folks ma maintained it. Or maybe everybody has it to various degrees and it's independently amplified in these three lineages. Or maybe the tree is wrong, okay? And there is a common ancestor. And I'm a neuroscientist and I just trust the geneticist or the phylogeneticist to get the tree right. But I learned from talking to that cr uh, group that th there are so many different trees out there actually, none of them bringing vocal learners together, depending on what genes you look at. So I teamed up with a uh, group of scientists that eventually formed what we call the Avian Phylogenetics Consortium along with the Genome 10K Consortium to sequence vertebrate genomes. And using uh, short read sequencing technology at the time, uh, <coughs> we uh, worked with BGI in China to sequence the genomes of 45 or 48 total when we added in the previous zebra finch and chicken and uh, turkey assembly, including uh, uh, most orders of birds, including multiple songbirds, uh, several parrots here, the kia and the budgiger, as well as close relatives of each one of these groups, including hummingbird, like pigeons, hummingbird, according to different phylogenetic trees in the literature. All right? <clears throat> and uh, then we asked, okay, all of us wanted to know, is the tree right? All right, so uh, for the first time we created, uh, well, we did a lot of studies, by the way, including with some here at the Allen Brain Institute. Uh, in red are the ones that uh, I collaborated on, and in blue are the ones that we helped on, and others have benefited from our genomes. And I'm going to talk about these two studies here on the phylogeny and the brain. And so, uh, <clears throat> so here is the tree I have been using for 15 years before this study. And here is the tree, a genome scale tree, uh, that we came up with uh, as a result of sequencing all these genomes. And here are all the rearrangements and the positions of the species along the tree. Okay, <laughs> according to a few genes or DNA hybridization versus the whole genome. And uh, the vocal learners in the red dots here, the songbirds, the parrots, and the hummingbirds are actually are still far apart. They actually pulls hummingbirds much further away from the songbirds and parrots. So one would argue three independent gains or one gain here and a few losses, or you have to go back to the time of, for these brain systems here, to the time of the distinction of dinosaurs to say there was a common origin followed by 10 losses in order to explain the commonality here. So we really think it's probably three independent gains. And we've done some computational analysis since then to argue that uh, it's, it's, it's like one in a million or one in a million chance that this could actually be a common origin. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> What about humans? So ask the question, well, if birds can come up with a similar solution over the last 65 million years, uh, are, is the brain pathways that are controlling what I'm doing now going to be much different? And so we began to ask that question. Uh, and here is a songbird brain, the zebra finch, uh, the, the cerebellum here, the midbrain, the hindbrain, the, uh, the, the cortical regions, and here is a human brain. Here is a zebra finch to scale with a human brain. You can fit 3,000 zebra finch brains into a human. So brain size doesn't matter all right, for this kind of trait. Neither does cortical folding. Uh, <clears throat> what matters, I think, is the presence of a type of neural network. But to understand what that neural network is like between humans and birds, we had to, uh, even before this project, uh, reevaluate um, a long 100-year-old view about vertebrate brain organization. And that view, coming from the patriarchs of comparative neuroanatomy, argued that in the human brain, you can find these basal structures called basal ganglia, or, and parts of them called paleostriatum or archistriatum for the amygdala here, and neostriatum for uh, these regions, that they argued you can find in non-vertebrate species, I mean non-mammalian vertebrates, whereas this paleostriatum started out in fish, uh, which then gave rise to an archostriatum, uh, the amygdala in amphibians, which gave rise to a neostriatum in reptiles, which then pass it on to birds and have this hyperstriatum. And the bird brain, as well as most non-mammalian vertebrates, were all called striatal regions, thought to be primitive basal ganglia structures. And only in, only in uh, mammals did you get this latest and greatest achievement they called the neocortex. And they did call it an achievement in those early uh, comparative neurobiology papers. And further, they argued that the uh, neocortex was biggest in Europeans. Uh, uh, next uh, size down in Asians and uh, smaller in Africans and finally in, non, in the, uh, the great apes, the smallest. Uh, all turned out not to be true, um, I think. I'm sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a testament to that here. Uh, so uh, so they, they brought basically religion, uh, 
ethnic views of you know, a superiority and ideas that the brain evolved in a Grand Canyon-like fashion with one sediment layer on top of the other. And so I organized a consortium of scientists in the early 2000s to evaluate all this evidence. We, we knew something was wrong with it. And uh, using some comparative gene expression profiling at that time, RNA-seq didn't exist and other things, we came up with this uh, Martin view where the avian brain, not just birds, but vertebrates in general, but shown here for birds, has a large cortical territory that in this case is uh, clustered instead of layered as it is in mammals. And here are the true basal ganglia, the striatum and the globus pallidus here, uh, homologs with uh, mammals. And, uh, but there is still debate in the uh, community and, and still exists today as to exactly what are the cell type homologies between non-mammalian vertebrates and mammals for the different layers of the cortex and the claustrum and amygdala. So now color coding it in more detail of a songbird brain with the rat brain. Uh, here the old view that's been around for 100 years that led to our terms like neocortex. Here this more recent view that we published where one argument is that these regions colored in blue, I mean sorry, in red and green and yellow are homologous to different layers of the cortex. We call that the nuclear layered hypothesis. And these regions the other uh, and the other hypothesis is that these three colors here are homologous to the claustrum and amygdala, and it's only this more dorsal region of the avian brain that's homologous to the six layers of the cortex. Uh, and s after that, about 2013, in my lab, a postdoc of mine, Chin Chin Chen at the time, we reanalyzed even our own updated Martin view, and uh, with some gene expression profiling of in situ hybridizations of 50 genes, and using other approaches to say we even got it wrong here, it's better than what was, has been around for 100 years, uh, that the, there's this lateral ventricle space here that closes up during development, and we argued that the cell populations up here have the same gene expression profiles and developmental trajectories as the cell, uh, uh, pro, you know, let's say origins, as the cell populations below the dotted line here, the ventricle. We call this the mirror image hypothesis, and that together these cell populations here as a field homology hypothesis is homologous to the different layers of the cortex plus different cell populations in the claustrum and amygdala. And so uh, <clears throat> jumping, oh, and why is all this important? Well, the song learning nuclei are inside these brain regions. And so if you're going to have to compare to humans, we want to get the cell type homologies right to make those comparisons to humans. Uh, <clears throat> And a more recent work from a graduate student in my lab, Greg Edmund, had tested this with RNA-seq data. Uh, even though we published this with uh, 50 genes by in situ organization, a lot of people didn't believe it. Uh, now we have 20,000 genes by RNA-seq and uh, cluster analysis of these different brain regions, uh, uh, not single cells, but you know, laser captured dissected regions, we get a similar clustering of brain regions above and below the ventricle here. So I think uh, we're pretty happy uh, with this model. Uh, and some of the regions, like the two regions uh, uh, that was once the, I showed you as a blue labeled and a red labeled here above this uh, ventricle space, there are only two genes that differ out of the 20,000 uh, as a population in their expression profiles. So now, with that model, we can actually then look at, um, uh, ask the question about the human brain and uh, parallels with uh, songbirds. And using a vision of the human brain I had back in 2004 uh, for, uh, from the literature, I argue that th this region of RA and this region of HVC is similar to layers 5 and 2 and 3 of the human laryngomotor cortex. And that this uh, region we called L-man involved in song learning would be similar to layers 2 and 3 of Broca's area for speech acquisition. Uh, this part of the basal ganglia involved in song learning in birds would uh, be uh, similar to a part of the anterior stratum of humans. Uh, and that you would not find these regions, or so far have not been found in non-human primates by that time. Uh, and the direct projections from these also, from the laryngeal motor cortex, from RA song nucleus in birds, have not been found in non-human primates as well. The only thing by 2004 that had been found in non-human primates is a putative laryngeal motor cortex, not in the primary cortex, but more anterior in premotor cortex areas that makes an indirect projection to regions that control vocalizations. Not so far at that time found in mice or as other uh, non-primate mammals. So it's with this <coughs> model trying to figure out, well, how, how could you get such a similar uh, brain pathway across diverse species of birds and with humans? Uh, 
And we really didn't have an answer. Actually, when we published some of those uh, papers before, uh, some of religious groups got hold of it and says that it proves the existence of God or intelligent design because how could you get seven brain regions or similar across these birds and shared with humans as well in terms of their function. And we didn't have an answer until uh, these studies here where we found that the brain regions that showed this media early gene activation due to producing learned sounds has brain regions surrounding all seven of them uh, that become active when uh, animals are producing uh, complex motor movements, in this case, hopping in a rotating wheel. Uh, and we found that this was the case for all the vocal learning species. Uh, and non-vocal learning species had these regions surrounding them, but there was no holes inside of them where the saw nuclei are located. So uh, <clears throat> the connectivity of these vocal learning nuclei also was similar to the connectivity of the surrounding brain areas, with some exceptions, like it made a direct projection to the motor neurons for vocalizations here, where here it makes an indirect projection to other motor neurons that control other movements, like limbs. And so uh, <clears throat> in the human brain, a colleague of mine, Steve Brown, found that when he put uh, people who learn how to dance, who, who are good, talented dancers in uh, pen imaging, and got them to do learned choreographed sequence of movements, uh, found that uh, the brain areas that showed the highest activation were directly adjacent to the brain areas that control speech, uh, like Broca's and uh, laryngeal motor cortex. And so putting all of that together, we came up with what I call the motor theory of vocal learning origin, where that all species, um, I argue, that vocalize have a brain stem circuit that produces innate vocalizations. They also have a motor learning pathway consisting of an anterior forebrain circuit involved in learning how to move different kinds of muscle groups, and a motor pathway that controls the actual production of the movements, whether it be a mammal, a bird, or a reptile, and otherwise. And that uh, <clears throat> I argued that during embryonic development, this motor learning circuit is replicated in parallel fashion multiple times. And that in us humans, and in parrots and songbirds, some mutation occurred that caused this pathway to duplicate one more time. And that duplicated brain pathway uh, then got hooked up to the pathway, took over the, uh, the circuit that controls vocalizations to get this emerging vocal learning circuit that comes out of the surrounding motor learning pathway. And if this is true, it just means spoken language is mostly a complex learned motor behavior, controlling the muscles of the larynx, the oral facial musculature, that is similar to brain circuits controlling other learned movements. And already, the motor learning pathway we know of mammals and birds receives auditory input. So you don't need that as a novelty. You just need uh, a motor learning circuit. So, <clears throat> so with this hypothesis, I decided how we're going to test this. And if it's true, uh, the genes that function inside the song learning circuit should be some similar to the genes around them. Uh, and the genes around them uh, in the motor learning circuit should be shared across species, including uh, uh, birds and mammals. And so to test uh, this, at that time, uh, is the third part of my talk here, we started to test this hypothesis, and that's when our collaboration here began, uh, to do laser capture dissection of the song learning nuclei of each of the vocal learning groups, including the surrounding motor areas, and profile them at that time to microarrays. And the Allen Institute uh, was doing something similar with human brains, uh, 3,700 samples uh, from six people uh, that um, I don't, most people know about this here, several hundred samples from uh, six monkeys, uh, including uh, different cortical layers uh, from the monkeys and uh, motor and uh, sensory regions, and profiled them to microarrays. And the students and postdocs in my lab at the time, Andres Fenning, Irina Hada, and Asiela Whitney, uh, did a lot of the wet lab work here for the birds, but also Andres, uh, working with Trigva and Ed, uh, did uh, some of the uh, computational work uh, to cross-reference the uh, genomes and the microarray results here of the different transcripts are profiled here. And, uh, <clears throat> and I thank Ed and Trigva for that collaboration. It was very useful, as well as Angie and uh, Amy who, at that time, who were helping us out with uh, in situ hybridizations on human brains. And <clears throat> uh, with uh, uh, this collaborative effort, we came up with the following model. To comp we found that on these microarrays, uh, between the, the bird brain and the Allen Institute data, we can find 7,000 orthologous genes. And how we're going to compare 7,000 orthologous genes between all the dissections of the songbird brain and the human brain, uh, what we did is develop a, uh, an algorithm that builds a tree 
of the uh, different gene expression profile, where each node of the tree is a vector of the 7,000 genes and their expression levels. And each branch in that tree is a differential expression vector of one node versus the other. And, we've, and we do that for birds. We did that for the human brain. And then we actually then use a dynamic programming algorithm that tries, like a genome alignment, align one tree of one species to the tree of another species and try to find an optimal alignment that is uh, statistically supported. And we were able to do that such that these nodes that we now, in our new understanding of vertebrate brain organization, what we call the telencephalic node or the striatal node or areas down here in the brainstem, matched in gene expression profiles across these species. Uh, what about the sawn learning nuclei? Of all the regions the RA saw nucleus can match in the human brain, of all the samples that were profiled here on the six human samples, it had the strongest molecular profile to the human laryngeal motor cortex. Uh, and, not, uh, and particularly for the macaque samples, another set of genes uh, matched layer five neurons of the uh, motor cortex, and not the amygdala, as one hypothesis had proposed. Uh, the area X saw nucleus involved in sawn learning matched a part of the human anterior striatum, not exactly where I put it before or predicted it, but uh, in coordinates that later on some colleagues showed is actually the area of the human brain that is most active when learning how to produce speech. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, not nucleus accumbens, as another hypothesis proposed. And we didn't find uh, any good matches for HVC in the L man saw nuclei, but we didn't profile the surrounding areas. More recently, Greg Edman has profiled the sawn nuclei and the surrounding areas that helps uh, obtain our specialized profiles more uh, accurately and found that HVC also matches the laryngeal motor cortex of that uh, microarray data set and also, uh, but not layer five neurons, but layers two, three neurons of the uh, macaque data. And so, uh, and it doesn't, uh, uh, L-man has a very weak match uh, to Broca's area of all the speech areas, but uh, we think that in that original profiling data set, for those six human samples here, Broca's area wasn't profiled well enough. And so this is still an open question of Broca's area matches anything in the uh, songbird brain. And so, uh, and it didn't match the claustrum rejecting that hypothesis that's been out there in the literature. Uh, what about the uh, <clears throat> non-vocal learning species? Of the genes, the 50 to 70 genes in each of these brain regions out of the 70,000 uh, that are up or down regulated that supported the convergent expression here, we didn't find any of them in a non-vocal learning bird species profiled or macaque or marmoset at the time. And so uh, what are some of those genes? Here is a heat map of 55 genes that had convergent expression in bird RA and human laryngeal motor cortex. Red is down, upregulated, blue is downregulated, and we find that uh, for the three bird, vocal learning bird species, we can see the profile here in the song production nucleus is more similar to the human laryngeal motor cortex from your samples here than it is to other motor regions in, uh, or where you would expect to find song nuclei in the non-vocal learning bird species or non-vocal regions of the human motor cortex. And uh, many of the down-regulated genes, there are many that surprised us, many of these like SLIP1, GAP43, NeuroD6 are involved in neural connectivity or neural development. Um, and they're turned off uh, or turned down in these brain regions. Others are turned up, like parvalbumin, uh, or involved more in neuroprotection. And so why do that? I think what's going on here is that uh, the, neural, I mean, the neural connectivity genes make sense since the connections for the speech areas differ, uh, but the upregulated ones uh, didn't quite make sense, except that um, I, one day I was thinking, well, vocal learners, they actually vocalize a lot. We talk a lot. You go out there in the woods and so forth early in the morning, who's out there singing? It's the songbirds. All right, what primate is vocalizing the most? It's us. And if you stick electrodes into these brain regions, they're firing at higher rates, even at baseline, without vocalizing, compared to the surrounding circuits. So I think uh, parvavimin and some other uh, genes involved in neuroprotection are trying to protect our circuits from overuse. That's the hand-waving hypothesis I have now. Uh, <clears throat> we tested out some of these with in situ hybridization in our lab as well as here. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the ones I'll focus on here is SLIT1. Uh, it's one of our favorite candidates because there was a lot of convergence uh, leading us to this gene. And we found that it is uh, down-regulated in the SOM production nuclei of each of the vocal learning species here. Uh, the white signal, again, is the mRNA product. We don't see such down-regulation in the non-vocal learning species. In the human brain, as well as in parrot, we saw two areas of down-regulation uh, as opposed to one, and we think uh, 
this is actually a brain path, another brain pathway duplication that in parrots and humans, the speech brain pathway has duplicated twice. And that's why uh, they have more complex behavior. Around that same time, Eddie Chang's lab uh, had done some useful work on human patients who are undergoing surgery to remove tumors or epileptic brain regions and found two hotspots of neural firing when, pe when we speak in these patients and the coordinates correspond pretty much similarly to where we find these two regions now we're calling ventral laryngeal motor cortex and dorsal laryngeal motor cortex in humans. Uh, <clears throat> and so here is that model I had 2004 and now jumping ahead to now uh, 2019 with the gene expression profiling, Eddie Chain's work and other work, revising our understanding of the organization of the, of the human brain. Now the consensus in the literature, like we've seen with the gene expression profiling, uh, with these two brain regions, is recognized as not one laryngeal motor cortex, there's two laryngeal motor cortex in human brains. And here um, are the areas we think are involved in speech acquisition, not yet well profiled in microarray or even RNA-seq data sets of the human brain. Uh, so that's what we'd like to do for the future. And we'd like to do that with more higher quality genomes. We discovered with those genomes, we sequenced at the time with short reads, that uh, they were useful for the kind of work we did here at high profile gene expression, uh, uh, not, you know, profiling many genes at once and generating some useful data. But when you then take an individual gene and you start to try to manipulate it, you discover that the assembly is usually wrong and you gotta correct the assembly, clone it out from many species again. I got tired of doing that. So uh, with the success of this avian phylogenomics project, leaders of the G10K consortium asked me to help lead that project. I'm now chair of it. And we uh, renamed it the Vertebrate Genomes Project to sequence not just 10,000 species, but all vertebrate species eventually all 70,000, and uh, <clears throat> an approach we're using for phase one on all orders is to take long reads, in this case PacBio, uh, make contigs out of them, uh, then link them together with 10x data linked reads across 100 kb molecules, then 300 kb bionanomolecules that are optical maps, link them together further, then use high c 3D interaction maps to scaffold them into full chromosomes, uh, albeit with gaps here in uh, these red uh, dips. And then um, <clears throat> uh, uh, gap fill with some of the uh, long reads here where we find some of these gaps and polish uh, them. They have some errors in the sequences, so we have to use the Illumina data to correct uh, some of the sequence so you don't get frame shift errors. Uh, and then do curation with the Sanger team at uh, Ensemble. And, uh, <clears throat> and I'm gonna tell you, it's been so much beneficial to have these high quality genomes. Uh, and if anybody's interested, we're actually doing them. And if you had the funds for a particular species, we'll do it for you. And uh, so here is the uh, zebra finch RNA-seq data that Craig uh, uh, generated, mapped back to the older zebra finch assembly, in this case, Sanger reads, uh, which are longer than the Illumina reads. And here, here is the mapping back to unique features in our new assembly, which was just uh, released by Ensemble yesterday uh, for, uh, for the zebra finch. Blue means you map back to the genome once, uh, uh, light blue means you map back twice, no mapping at all for the RNA-seq data. We're over basically close to 98% uh, mapping here. Uh, and the same thing for ATAC-seq data from uh, Lindsay Caton, the graduate student in the lab. Here is the old zebra finch assembly, and we're getting 10% of the genome we're not seeing an ATAC signal for, 23% for double mapping. With the longer read assemblies, now we actually reduce what we call false positive or false duplicated genes that are in these assemblies. Uh, and that's why we have fewer uh, duplicate uh, mappings of the ATAC data and also much less of the uh, uh, cut down the non-mapped uh, ATAC-seq data to half. And so with this type of data, data we've also identified more, 5,000 more significant ATAC peaks between the sawn nucleus and the surround. And so why do all of this? Our hypothesis is that the convergent gene expression we're seeing across these bird species and between birds and humans is a result of convergent changes in regulatory regions, uh, that we would see differences in epigenetic changes and enhancers and so forth that are regulating these genes in a convergent way. And this is what we're testing now. And uh, one of the genes we're testing is NeuroD6, which regulates the SLT1 gene. Uh, here, we found it's like, neuro, like SLT1, it's down-regulated in the RA cell nucleus in the human speech motor cortex regions. Uh, here at the Allen Institute, uh, it's one of the ones that was clearly showing down regulation in the in situ hybridizations. And what Lindsay has done is uh, profiled the ATAC uh, signal here 
of the neurons inside the solar nucleus versus the outside. And uh, with these new genomes, we are finding peaks uh, here, like inside RNA, there RNA solar nucleus, there is a peak of uh, open chromatin signal that we do not see in the surrounding neurons upstream of the uh, pr uh, protein coding sequence of this gene and several other peaks in, in the reverse orientation. And these little uh, blue uh, bars here means that these regions here, particularly this one with this differential ATAC peak, it has accelerated sequence only in the vocal learning bird species, convergent acceleration in hummingbirds, songbirds, and parrots. And when we look at the accelerated sequence here with the, uh, um, the red showing the nucleotide changes in this region, uh, in all three vocal learning species, they basically convert this uh, sequence from a apparent uh, no binding site of any transcription factor to a signal for the androgen receptor. And why androgen in this case, I don't know, except that song learning in these birds is a sexually dimorphic behavior. And this could be uh, maybe a clue as to how you sexually dimorph dimorphize this circuit, regulating the neural D6 gene so that the males sing and the females don't. It's something we're testing out. All right. <clears throat> uh, so uh, to summarize a lot of work that's going on with this, uh, what we think could be going on is as follows. Across these different bird species, uh, there's a mutation in blue here uh, in this regulatory region, we think it's a regulatory region, that allows the antigen receptor to bind to it only in the vocal learning species, but not the non-vocal learning species. Once the antigen receptor binds, we think it suppresses neuro-D6, preventing it from being expressed, which then cannot then go on to regulate slit one and preventing it from being uh, uh, upregulated there. And that, <clears throat> uh, but you have, how are you gonna cause that knockdown, basically, of that expression in the song learning nucleus, but not the surrounding nucleus, well, you then you coat that region with histones and other molecules to prevent the, the repressor from binding so that in the other brain regions that are not involved in vocal learning, you can continue to have high expression of this uh, axon guidance gene. And so why would you want to downregulate these genes? The hypothesis we're working on now is that slit one, when it binds to its receptor robo one, it's a repulsive interaction, all right? And so uh, we think in a non-vocal learning species, when the cortical neurons from layer five synapse onto the brainstem, uh, the, we find that the motor neurons have high robo one receptor. We think that repels these axons from forming connections with them. But in the humans and songbirds, uh, the neurons have been downregulated. I mean, the slit one has been downregulated, possibly through neuro D6. And we think then that this then allows direct projections from the cortex layer five neurons to form onto the brainstem alpha motor neurons to now have direct control over the muscles for vocal behavior. And we think in humans for other behaviors. And so, uh, uh, and that's shown here in a more uh, graphic form here, this laryngeal motor cortex with both direct and indirect projections to the neurons that control the larynx. And in non-human primates so far, at least from the premotor cortex, it's only been found to be indirect. And so we'd like to test this idea and uh, uh, by doing so, we would like to then say upregulate SLIP1 or neuro D6 in the uh, vocal production regions and see if we can make an in, a direct projection indirect and block vocal learning. Conversely, downregulate it here in the motor pathway of a non vocal learning species and see if we can make an indirect projection direct and maybe even take it over an existing motor learning circuit without it having to replicate it uh, and get the chicken to do something like a songbird can do. All right, uh, we would want to do the same thing, make some tests in humans or non-human primates. That's a little tougher, but um, what about mice? And so uh, that's the question that we're asking now. And when we asked the question about mice, uh, nobody had been studying mice vocal behavior. We, at that time, when we were asking these questions, uh, it, was, it was assumed that mice are non-vocal learners. So I'm gonna end off on mice and uh, <clears throat> to tell you that uh, Tim Holley's group started recording their vocalizations uh, in the ultrasonic range back in 2005, even before that people were doing this, and found that they produced these sequences, this is a sonogram of time and the frequency of the sound, that when pitched down to the human hearing range sounds something like this. It sounds like a bird, right? <laughs> and these, and males mostly do this, and they chase females, uh, producing these sequences of vocalizations, what we now consider in courtship song, and, uh, and different brothers will produce different 
combinations of syllable types, the down, up, uh, or the down or the up jumps and so forth, and uh, indicating that there's some differences from one individual to the animal to the other. And this prompted my lab and a number of other labs to ask, have we been wrong the whole time? Are mice vocal learners? And the answer is no. They're not vocal learners, all right? Uh, they, some labs have uh, shown, including ours, that there are small plasticity differences uh, in these mice uh, that was unexpected, but not to the degree that you see in a songbird or other vocal learners. And others claim no plasticity in the vocal behavior, no learning at all. Uh, <clears throat> and, and several students and postdocs in my lab at that time were working on this. And, but it does make a difference uh, in uh, the kind of song that these animals produce. We find that uh, in the presence of females, the male mice produce more complex syllables than just uh, smelling female urine, by the way. All right? They like to sing when they smell female urine. And if you give females a choice between these two songs, they will spend more time by the speaker producing the more sexier songs, we like to call them, uh, than these more simple songs uh, for the same amount and the same volume. And so uh, what about in the brain? When these mice sing, surprisingly, we did find the region of the uh, cortex that had vocalizing associated activity, which we thought weren't, wasn't going to be there. Uh, but it's also mixed in with uh, uh, neurons that control other motor behaviors, not just vocalizations. When we test the connect connectivity of these brain circuits, injecting a transsynaptic trace in the laryngeal muscles, we found that that same region has a set of layer five neurons uh, that's backfill from this transsynaptic tracer to the laryngeal muscles. Uh, here it's shown at higher power. And when we inject tracer there, we find that uh, these neurons have uh, axons that go down to the brown labeled motor neurons here, one or two or three axons per motor neuron, not the hundreds or so that you get in a songbird in human. So we think that this direct connection is there, but it's a difference of degree, a big degree difference, uh, as opposed to absolute yes or no. Uh, and when we lesion this region, uh, the vocalizations don't go away, but they do lose some ability to modulate the pitch. And so, uh, <clears throat> so what about uh, the genes themselves? Uh, when we test for them, like SLIT1, NeuroD6, and so forth, we don't see the kind of down or up regulation we see in humans and the song learning birds in this mouse motor cortex region, uh, which we're calling a putative laryngeal motor cortex. So this leads us to a new hypothesis I'm calling the continuum vocal learning hypothesis, where it's not all or none, but you have various species like lizards who don't vocalize at all, so they can't even have vocal learning. Uh, to limited vocal learners like maybe mouse or even to, uh, some great apes who can learn how to voice a sound through cough but not learn how to imitate, or these mice with a little bit of pitch modulation, uh, to bats and songbirds, uh, the more complex vocal learners, finally to humans and parrots who are the more advanced ones. Uh, and so <clears throat> uh, if, if this continuum hypothesis is true, it means that maybe we can take a little miniature circuit here in a mouse or even a non-human primate, like a marmoset, uh, and uh, genetically uh, take the uh, gene regulatory patterns we find in the human brain, uh, put them in a mouse brain, and maybe enhance the circuit, like with SLIT1 or NeuroD6. Uh, and this is what we're trying now. Uh, we've been uh, able to upregulate SLIT1 here in this red signal in the RA cell nucleus of songbirds, and we find when we do that, the higher the overexpression of this gene, it's actually the human version, in the songbird brain, the, the bird song starts to deteriorate in terms of syllable similarity from one bout to another. Uh, we've been able to downregulate with an RNAi molecule in the mouse putative laryngeal motor cortex hooked up to a GFP molecule. Uh, in this case, the mice don't sing more complex vocalizations. They just sing more simple ones and actually much less. So something uh, impacted vocalizations, but um, uh, not to the degree in that we were looking for. Uh, work done from a former postdoc and a graduate student in my lab. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Boyd Lomax, who's a postdoc now, has uh, been able to uh, get uh, transgenic mice with slit one knockdown, particularly in the cortex only, as not throughout the rest of the body, and uh, finds that in these mice they survive just fine, uh, and when you pr present them with a female, they actually produce more complex, this is a, a density plot of the different syllable types, they produce a, a whole series of more complex syllable types than you see in the wild type mice, the, homo, the homozygous knockouts, uh, which is quite remarkable. You can just take out a gene and producing more complex syllables. So um, uh, this gene gets more interesting because SLIT1 is also regulated by FOXP2, a gene that many have heard about. 
that when mutated in humans, it's a transcription factor, uh, that when mutated in humans causes a speech deficit that's more specific to speech than other behaviors. And so here is a child uh, with a FOXP2 heterozygous uh, knockdown. Your name? Laura. She's trying to say Laura. Where do you live, Laura? And how old are you? Four. She said four. So this is a four-year-old child with a, a, a stop codon mutation in the FOXP2 gene and uh, has difficulty producing learn imitated sounds but has good auditory learning and other good motor coordination. Not everything is fine with Laura or her or other family relatives that have the mutation, um, but the, the vocal behavior seems to be the most affected. Uh, her siblings without the mutation are fine. And so uh, we took Laura's mutation, basically, uh, with Simon Fisher working with him, uh, to create a transgenic mouse that has a heterozygous mutation of that same mutation, and then we looked at the vocal behavior. People have looked at these mice before and found nothing really dramatically different with the vocalizations, except they might vocalize a little less. Uh, but they didn't use the tools we developed for songbirds. When we did that, uh, we found that <coughs> wild-type mice, as I said, when they see a female, they produce, uh, they do produce songs with these more complex syllable types. This is uh, a proportion of songs with complex syllables. But with the FOXP2 mutation, they can still sing, but they only produce more of these simple syllable type songs. Uh, <coughs> and so what about the neurons in the cortex that project down to the laryngeal uh, motor neurons? They exist there. Uh, with a transsynaptic tracer in the, in the FOXP2 mutant mice. Uh, and here is wild-type distribution in the brain, but in the FOXP2 mutant mice, they're more spread out in the motor cortex, even outside the primary motor cortex, compared to the wild-type. So we think FOXP2 is necessary to localize these neurons more tightly into a laryngeal motor cortex region. Uh, so I'm going to end now with future directions, and I put this here because I would like to collaborate with you guys again. And, uh, and thinking going forward, here is what we're trying to do, besides some of the things I just showed you now. Uh, and I won't have time to say everything, but uh, uh, some of the things I'm talking about is in this uh, Science Magazine article here, that, um, and the special issue is a very uh, useful issue to read if you want to learn some more about the neurobiology of language. So here is the model that I'm working on now of bird brains that have, or, that have vocal learning or mammal brains that have vocal learning like humans and non-learning species. And here is the detailed neural pathway network connectivity that we know of for songbirds. We know more about the vocal learning circuit of songbirds than humans. Uh, and here I highlighted the different cell types that I predict in the human uh, cortex and basal ganglia and so forth that would correspond to these specific neuron types that uh, control vocal learning circuits in birds. Uh, and the question is, are the individual neurons here functioning like layer two neurons in laryngeal motor cortex, or layer three neurons, and two and three, and so forth, in the uh, uh, premotor Broca's area, and so on. And so <clears throat> we would like to do single cell profiling uh, with this hypothesis in mind of all these different brain regions in the songbird circuit and the similar brain regions in the uh, human speech uh, language pathway. Uh, and uh, this also serves as a model for people to test physiology, connectivity, and so forth hypotheses. Where are things similar? Where are they different? Uh, <clears throat> what about other vertebrates? Uh, uh, so here is a, a sort of a cortical map of now, with our newer understanding of vertebrate brain organization, of the cortex of all different vertebrate lineages here. And uh, here is where the vocal learning circuits evolved to control vocal behavior. One thing I can do now is say I, can, I won't be alive, but I'll, I'll predict that some of these other vertebrate groups, uh, one or two species, would evolve vocal learning half a million years from now. It's going to look similar like this. Right? The other thing I'd really like to know is that what are the different cell type homologies across these different vertebrate groups so we can really translate across these different species and determine what's homologous, what's convergent, and what's different. Uh, and I think single cell profiling or single nuclei profiling would help in that direction. And here is a slide, I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but I recently uh, did get an award uh, from NIH, a transformative R1 grant, to really see if we can get mice to imitate sounds. And we're gonna test it using viral vectors, uh, using human stem cells injected into a mouse brain, uh, or transgenic animals uh, with candidate genes we've identified with the Allen Institute, uh, to, to like we did with FOXP2, create transgenic animals 
uh, with as many genes as possible in their regulatory regions that contain humans to put it in the mouse brain. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, finally, uh, like I said, we need these high quality genome assemblies uh, to do all of this work. I'm almost doing this not as because it's a great thing to do, it's just say you can sequence all these species, uh, because it's necessary. Uh, we, I don't think it's necessary to do all 70,000 species. By the way, these numbers, I have to correct them recently. When we actually went to the literature, uh, this is what Wikipedia says, right, and some others say. When we actually calculate the number of named species, there are 71,500, not 66,000. And so collaborating with various groups, uh, we're now in the first phase, and how could this benefit uh, the Allen Institute, we actually raised most of the money for these 260 orders through crowdfunding among scientists. Uh, the goal being to produce the highest quality possible of error-free, near gapless, chromosomal level haplotype phase. You gotta phase haplotypes to prevent errors and use those genomes to address you know, fundamental questions in biology and disease. And for phase one, we chose, we defined orders as species that have divergence times sometime after the last mass extinction because we realize what most taxonomists classify as orders in birds and mammals were species sometime, or lineages that diverge sometime past that period. That then adds up to uh, 52 birds, 58 mammals, as what we're, we've, we're trying to redefine as orders, and we'll figure that out once we have the genomes, whether that's true. And, uh, and so here is just the numbers of the 260 species that we're focused on now, and we have about half of them, or 180 of them are committed, any more species where we're looking for funds for. Uh, so to end off, <coughs> uh, the take home message is here that complex behaviors can evolve multiple times from deeply homologous but uh, diverse brain circuits, uh, and cells and genes. A trait like spoken language can be understood by studying distant related species, including uh, uh, songbirds, not just non-human primates. And convergent evolution, um, for this trait, and I didn't, like I showed you for the FOXP2 mutation and some other things I didn't show you, is associated with disorders of that trait. So if the genes are convergent, when you mutate th that gene in one species, uh, even though it's convergent, it can function in a similar way in causing a disorder in a uh, convergently um, modified species. So, um, <clears throat> so we are getting to the point, I think we're tr understanding these differences of why we can't get our closest relatives to say something as simple as apple, and maybe one day we'll get them to do that. So you saw the, uh, uh, this takes a large team of people. I, I credit the people throughout, and I'll just leave it here uh, with my funders, and thank everybody for your attention. Yes? I'm going to turn on the mic, but I'll, I'll paraphrase the question. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so there's this species of mice that Michael Long Lab works with, and they're very similar to singing bir songbirds. That's right. Yeah, so I'm wondering if you look at Yes, uh, and, and, and my lab and Michael Long's lab were collaborating together on, on multiple projects, including uh, some rodent work. Uh, <coughs> so yes, so there's, there's these mice that produce their kinds of songs uh, in the hearing range for humans. And uh, what they found is that there is a, not the laryngeal motor cortex region, but they found even a more anterior cortex region that controls turn taking. Uh, that the mice, is, it'll control, uh, one mice has suppressed its ability to sing and they'll do this um, back and forth singing. What do you call that? Call and response. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> that's different than the region that we found. Uh, and, but they did find also a laryngeal motor cortex region in their mice as well and we found the anterior cortical region as well. And I think what it is, it's more like a premotor cortex region that might be more analogous to what you would see in Broca's area, uh, the precursor of, of that in mice. So you haven't done the gene expression? We haven't done the gene expression of that brain region yet, no. Thanks, and just one But I, wouldn't, I, I, I don't think it's gonna have any kind of specialized gene expression. I think these are just preliminary circuits out of which the speech circuits evolved. And, and then became specialized later for their genes. Thanks, and just a curiosity question. You spoke about elephants and bats. Mm -hmm. So what about those? Do they have so there, the there's a whole group of labs now studying bats, uh, and uh, there is one study out there that indicates that they have a focus, they have an isolated laryngeal motor cortex region as uh, seen in songbirds, but it's not yet well characterized. Uh, but I think in another five years, uh, we're gonna learn a lot more about bats uh, and have more of the circuit mapped out. Uh, for elephants, they're kind of big. Um, <clears throat> I do have a piece of motor cortex in my freezer. 
I have no idea which is the laryngeal motor cortex. And uh, uh, I think you know, we're going to need some new novel technologies to uh, uh, handle these big brains. So I think it's going to take a while before we understand the neurobiology of vocal learning in elephants. And even people are, some people are doubting that because some of the learned sounds elephants produce, they produce it by putting their trunk in their mouth and moving the oral motor cavity uh, to produce the sounds as opposed to use the larynx. But other sounds, they do use the larynx. OK, over here. Being the Allen Institute, I'm going to. Um, yeah, so you would imagine that if you want to have these fine motor controls, you'd want different uh, population dynamics within these brain regions. Mm -hmm. um, have you or anyone else looked at the cell type diversity in these regions and how that differs uh, from a single cell transcriptomic or similar method? and how that differs between le learning and non-learning. Uh, yeah, so, we, so we've, we've done some, well, before, we've done some single cell, uh, single nuclei and single cell work um, that's uh, in its early stages, but even before I answer that, I just want to say that what I'm surprised that now with the RNA-seq data, but like I said, with the, with, with the microarray data, we had about 100-something genes out of which 55 were convergent, let's say, for the laryngeal motor cortex. Now in the, with the microarray data, we're seeing, depending on the song learning nucleus, it's anywhere from uh, 400 to like 1,500 genes that have specialized expression in these neurons. It's almost like they're becoming a different cell type uh, buried within the brain uh, region. It's still not all the genes are different. Yet. But it'd be super cool if certain cell types, you could see like, ah, oh, this cell type has, you know, is changing in this way. Yes. And that cell type is changing in that way. Yes, and that we don't have the answer for yet. Uh, we, ha we have to, with the, with the li limited single nuclei data we have, we have been having a hard time figuring out what cell type is which. Uh, so uh, we, we need to do that again. But I, I, I agree with you. This would be a good question to ask. Oh, 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 okay. So uh, I was curious about you having this the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis that I mean this uh, behavior involved independently through revolution. So it's likely that it's triggered by simple events, but great consequence. And, and then uh, in your um, the enhancer analysis that's showing that mutation, do you think that is the root cause of everything? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Um, when we published this, uh, you know, this paper in 2014 with Ed and others, um, Religious groups got a hold of that one too and said, you know, 55 genes and so forth that are convergent has to be intelligent design. And we still didn't have an answer there. And what I'm, the model I'm going on now is I don't think 50 to 100 or so genes in different brain regions are going independent mutations to get us there. No, but, but since NeuroD is a master regulator. I think they're, yeah. I think they're, so you know, maybe need to change five or 10 or so uh, as, as master regulators to get a cascade effect. Yeah. That, that's the hypothesis we're working with now. Uh, and it is the case that not all genes that show a change in expression in the song learning nuclei have an epigenetic difference upstream in their regulatory regions. Like the neuro D6 was a clear one, slip one, we can't find a clear regulation. So that's why we think also neuro D6 could be regulating the difference in slip one. So, once, so if we manipulate neuro D6, maybe we'll manipulate the uh, uh, 20 or 50 other genes as a result. Yeah, uh, that's my question. Yes, <laughs> All yes. right, thank that, you. That's the hypothesis we're working with. Over here. There you go. I think I heard it. Yeah. Or, or you can speak up loud. Yeah. Okay. It works. Thank you. It's it's a great it's a, it's a great talk. So Thank I was wondering the question about uh, the neural dynamics perspective because as you mentioned, speech and is might be considered as a very complex dynamic problem. So is there, are there any efforts apart from genetic characterization of the cross-species differences using the electrophysiological measures to like to compare the neural dynamics that is happening between different species between let's say the bird songs and hu humans? Yeah, so um, <coughs> I've been asking Eddie Chang and others who do surgery on humans and I haven't got a clear answer because it is, it is, it is the case in multiple vocal learning species, as I mentioned earlier, if you, even at baseline, you put electrodes, uh, the interneurons, the excitatory neurons, they all have higher firing rates. And, and you, can, you can identify this as a projection neuron that fires like a layer five neuron. 
You can identify this as like a PV, positive neuron, and so forth. But there's something else also different about their firing properties compared to the surrounding brain areas, which we think are more homologous with uh, mammals. And so, um, and a number of these genes that we see differ also are involved in neuroplasticity and, and signaling between cells. So uh, the only thing I can think of why change some of the firing property of these neurons is that the laryngeal muscles are, besides the lateral rectus mm -hmm. muscle of the eye, right, are the fastest firing muscles in the body. Uh, and you need to integrate a, a rapid sound information also with the firing of these muscles for feedback and for learning. And so I think um, the firing rates and the ability to handle fast firing rates has been sped up in these neurons. And in fact, it's not just the interneurons that it, parvovimin, I mentioned, is specialized. It's specialized not only in, in high regulation, the interneurons, but also the projection neurons in layer five equivalent. And it's been shown in human brains by Chet Sherwood and others that layer five neurons in the oral motor cortex of humans has high par parvovimin expression uh, compared to other non-human primates. And so I think it's there to c control something, you know, simple, rapid integration of signals. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>